But it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Calvin Shear. Dr. Shear graduated from the University of Sealy in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and the Center for Microscope and Microanalysis. And then I went to Hopkins University, Johns Hopkins University as postdoctor research associate in there, and uh, as assistant uh, research scientist there until 2018. He joined our uh, university. He ran now he's an assistant professor in the department uh, for uh, material science and uh, engineering. Well, okay, thank you so much, Eugene, for the uh, very nice and very kind introduction. Um, I slightly like shortened my presentation title. I call that TEM based orientation and strain mapping. When we think about like pictures, we have three dimensions. So the first dimension is like first two dimensions, that's X and Y. We take a picture, you are dealing with a matrix. So you have X and Y. Each pixel, you have a number that tells us the intensity. That's how we can see stuff. So that's the third dimension. Then what is the fourth dimension? If we can also capture the diffraction information for each pixel that gives us the fourth dimension. So X, Y, that's two dimensions. The intensity, like the number assigned to that pixel that gives us the color, the intensity, that's the third dimension. The diffraction information embedded in that pixel that gives us the fourth dimension in the data. By using the fourth dimension data, we'll be able to do TEM-based orientation and the strain mapping. Uh, a lot of work I showed today, they were actually done by the previous postdocs, as well as current students. Um, also, some of the work was done by um, my previous advisor at Hopkins and uh, my previous group member, um, Paul Rotman, while I was at Hopkins. Paul now is an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky. So let's jump straight into orientation mapping. What is orientation mapping? So the example here shows you like one EBSD map of a ceramic called boron carbide. EBSD stands for electron back, uh, backscatter diffraction. From EBSD, you see a colorful map. What information you can get from EBSD? First, you can get the crystal orientation and texture information. Each color you see here, like some of the grains are red in color, some of the grains are green or blue in color. Each color tells you one orientation. Um, in materials, we deal with like FCC, PCC, those simple structures. Um, in soil and crop science, I'm not sure whether you guys deal with like geological samples. Um, I hope you are familiar with like 001, like 011, 111, these kind, kind of orientations. Each orientation will give you one color. And the orientation with one, within one grain will be the same. So we can tell this is one grain, this is another. Also, EBSD maps can tell us the texture, whether there's a preferred texture, like most of the grains are aligned in one direction or they're randomly arranged. So that's um, another piece of information we can obtain from EBSD maps. The second type of information is phase information. Um, if you deal with like a duplex steel, you have FCC and BCC using EBSD, you can also easily map, here's the FCC phase, here is the BCC phase. You can also study the grain size. Nowadays, the computer softwares are so advanced, the computer can speed out like the grain size distribution, give you the histogram. You can also get the grain morphology, whether the grains are elongated or these are acquiesced. You can also look at grain boundary characteristics, whether the grain boundaries are high angle grain boundaries, like high misorientations, or low angle grain boundaries with small degrees of misorientations. You can also look at special boundaries called twin boundaries. Twin boundaries by symmetry, just behaves like a mirror. On one side, you see the crystal structure. On the other side, you see the mirror image of that. These are the merits of using EBSD. It's an SEM-based technique, scanning electron microscope-based technique. There are, um, oh, I nearly forgot, there's one important advantage. It's pretty. If you have colorful pictures in your publication, usually they tend to attract attention and uh, just pleasing to the eyes. Um, those are the advantages of using EBSD in an SEM but there are some intrinsic limitations. So the first limitation is sample prep. For those who have done EBSD, you know how challenging the sample prep can be. It's time consuming and effort demanding. To get good samples is very difficult. Uh, in microscopy, we say like rubbish in, rubbish out. If you have like a crappy sample, you'll get uh, crappy results. The second is more limited by the fundamental physics. It has limited spatial resolution. This is because in SEM, you focus your probe to a very fine, like to a fine, fine size, the electron beam will actually interact 
with the material. Even if you focus the probe, tune the probe to something say nanometer, one nanometer or sub nanometer, the interaction volume will be greater than that. It's kind of like, you know, um, like in, in bowling, you hit one pin, that pin can spin around and affect other pins. So you are not only getting the information from that single pin, you actually get the information from the surrounding information too. Um, this limits the spatial resolution of EBSD to 20 nanometers to 50 nanometers, depends on the beam setting. In contrast, in TEM, um, TEM stands for transmission electron microscopy. You are dealing with a much thinner sample. So the samples are usually 100 nanometers in thickness. And the beam broadening in the sample is quite limited. So by doing that, we can get much better spatial resolution, usually three to five nanometers. So there's a 10 times improvement of the uh, spatial resolution. Um, in the audience, like how many of you have used SEM? How many of you have used TEM? No? Okay, which is fine. Okay, SEM, you can view that as a technique looking at the other surface. You are throwing ping pong balls on the surface. Then the ping pong balls will just bounce back and you capture the information. If you have a hill, if you have a valley, the ping pong balls will bounce in different ways, give you different contrast. So it's a surface technique. That's what SEM does. For TEM, um, instead of like, you know, looking at the other surface, um, it, the electron beam will go through the sample. So that's why it's called transmission electron microscopy. The beam goes through the specimen, casting a shadow. And what we do as electron microscopists or TEM microscopists, what we do is from the shadow, work backwards and tell what's going on in the real space. Assume you have a slice of glass, you have air bubbles trapped in the uh, slice of glass, or like, you know, some flies trapped in the, in the glass. You shine light, you see a shadow, then you work backwards, try to tell what's going on in the glass slide. I hope that like um, gives you some, some background information about SEM and the TEM. Okay, the good thing about TEM is the sample's so thin. So when the electron runs in, it doesn't scatter like crazy. There's a limited sample to scatter electron. The beam broadening is not as bad as in SEM. That's how fundamentally we improve the spatial resolution. Then how can we use this technique and generate useful information? So the technique is called PED, precession electron diffraction. Um, it works very similar to SEM. In SEM, you capture signal pixel by pixel, just like the old TV set. You have the cathode ray, cathode gun at the back. Then it scans on the screen. So you get information pixel by pixel. Similarly here, you um, also get the diffraction information pixel by pixel. Um, for diffraction, uh, I don't know how familiar like, um, you are with the concept. The easiest way to think, about it, to think about it is the double slit experiment. Back in high school, if you have two slits, you propagate a wave, then the wave will interfere, give you like bright features and the dark features. When there's constructive interference, you see something bright. When it's destructive interference, you see something dark. It's the same idea here. In this technique, each pixel will acquire the diffraction pattern. So the bright spots you see here, these are from the constructive interference. The dark areas, these are the destructive interference. The only difference from high school physics is in high school physics, we use water wave. Here, we use electron wave. Okay, so each pixel, we acquire the raw data then the raw data will be compared to the simulated data in the database. In this case, we can get two types of information. First is the face, whether it's like cubic, hexagonal, like, you know, uh, triclinic, that kind of information. The second type of information is the orientation, whether it's one, 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 or one, like, you know, one, two, three. By doing that pixel by pixel, we can construct a map um, the example you see here, that's a nanocrystalline copper. And if you look at the uh, um, scale bar, this is 100 nanometers. Many of the grains here, they are tens of nanometers in size. This is way beyond the resolution limit of SEM but we're, um, or EBSD, but we're getting something very similar to EBSD. So many people say PED is like TEM-based EBSD. But we can definitely do more than that. You'll see that in like about five, 10 minutes. Then how can we use this technique to solve engineering problems? So I'll share with you one example. 
Um, I worked on boron carbide for a number of years. Boron carbide is a, a body armor material. So it's lightweight, super hard. It's like slightly softer than diamond and a lot cheaper than diamond. Um, it's crazy to wear like diamond body armor on the, on the battlefield, you will be the, the target for sure. Um, the one thing uh, our collaborators are interested in is how boron carbide deforms. Um, what we do is we used a technique called nano indentation. For nano indentation, we use like a, like a probe, diamond probe, then press into the material. And we know boron carbide is a ceramic, it's like a rock, like it's a ceramic, it's brittle. So there are two possibilities when we bring something fairly sharp to probe it. The first scenario is we bring the diamond probe, cracks will just nucleate and grow in the specimen. So that's the, uh, the first scenario. The second scenario is um, there will be some quasi-plastic zone or damage zone developed, then the cracks will grow from the interface of the deformed zone or damaged zone and the pristine zone. Any guesses? Like considering something um, is brittle, um, the cracking, like, you know, especially assuming a bullet is hitting it, but this is at much lower rate. Um, are you getting cracks straight away or you're actually having some, like, you know, damage accumulated in the material, then crack? Any guesses? One or two? Two. Okay, excellent. Well, well, <laughs> excellent. So <laughs> you guys are exactly right. Usually people think the first one, but okay. Um, this is a TEM micrograph of like um, the, the indent. You still see the impression here. So this is the, the uh, nano indenter tip impression after removing the, uh, the tip, and you can see that. So if we look at the pristine zone, you get the diffraction. Again, not surprising, you see like, you know, bright spots. Uh, I usually describe that like starry night. Um, you see a lot of stars in the, in the, in the sky. Um, here you also see some elastic strain area. So the contour or the uh, bright and the dark stripes you see here, that's from the elastic strain. So you, you kind of like slightly bend something. Uh, you also see a crack. That's the crack, which anim uh, uh, animated from the damage zone. In the damage zone, if you do the diffraction, it's a lot more chaotic. So this is a classical single crystal diffraction. You see really beautiful arrays of pattern. And this is something a lot more chaotic. Um, using regular TEM, it's extremely difficult to tell what's going on in the damage zone. So we used PED to look at the microstructure in detail. So this is the map we acquired. Again, this is the impression left behind from the nano indentation. Um, the first thing I'd like to show you is most of the colors are more or less the same. So the pristine zone is red. Also within the uh, um, damaged zone, um, the orange red each color. What this tells us is the orientation is more or less the same as the parent grain in the damage zone. If we zoom in further and overlay the misorientation, we can see like here, we don't get too much misorientation. These are like blue, like boundaries, um, about three degrees. It's really directly underneath the tip. You see a lot of things going on. Then I went to Professor Fa, who is an expert in nano indentation, and asked him like, what's going on here? Then he told me in nano indentation, you have like two sides and there's a tip. When you probe the other specimen, on the sides, you get a lot of shear. If it's shear, you don't get reorientation of the crystals. So the crystals are just gliding on top of each other, but directly underneath the, uh, the, the tip is a combination of hydrostatic stress and the shear. So in this case, the stress state is more complicated. The crystals can reorient. And that's why we see kind of like a fragmentation of the, uh, the crystal in this case. Um, the next question um, we asked ourselves was, is this like an artifact, is that real? So we looked at the misorientation profile. Um, we drew a line just here, and on the y-axis, that's the distance. On the, sorry, on the x-axis, that's the, the distance. Y-axis the, uh, is the uh, misorientation angles. You can see um, roughly, like, you know, they are about like two degrees to 10 degrees apart. So those are the misorientation. We also know here it's elastically strained region. Elastic strain will cause slight bending and that will cause some misorientation. We also drew a line here. And most of the misorientation is about two degrees. We also know there's a crack here. When there's a crack, the stored energy is released. So I call this is like pristine, pristine zone on the left-hand side. 
we drew a line here, it's just zero. So this tells us what we measure is likely to be true. So indeed, we have a lot of misorientation here. Then what causes the crystal fragmentation before we had one crystal? After deformation, the crystal fragmented and, the, and the rotated under the, uh, the stress. Then exactly what happened, we went to do some high-res TEM in the um, damaged zone directly underneath the, uh, the diamond tip, we found something we call amorphization. Amorphization is something turns from crystalline into amorphous. Amorphous is just uh, like a fancy name to call glass. If it's crystalline, you see like um, well-organized array kind of structure. It's more like a military parade. Um, amorphous, there's no order. It's kind of like people on Times Square or like nowadays people on campus. So running in all different directions. So um, in this case, like we have crystalline here and we see some lattice fringes here. If we draw the, uh, the lattice fringes, they are not exactly parallel to each other. There's a small rotation. And this rotation, the crystal rotation is accommodated by amorphization. So you can view amorphization as something viscous that's allowed for the crystal fragmentation and the rotation. That's why we saw the misorientation uh, in the damage zone. Okay, I'll switch gear a little bit. Uh, in the Bowen carbide community, people have been saying amorphization is really bad for the ballistic performance. Um, if there's a lot of amorphization, cracks can travel along the amorphous phase and cause like um, shattering, the body armor shattering like crazy. So the Bowen carbide community has been trying to suppress amorphization for the past 10 years, I guess. Um, we collaborated with uh, the Army Research Lab, as well as Rutgers University and uh, Johns Hopkins University. At Rutgers University, what they were able to do was to dope silicon into boron carbide. The doping is very similar in semiconductor industry. Silicon, you dope either with boron or dope with phosphorus. Um, same idea here in boron carbide. Um, our collaborators doped um, that with silicon. Um, th this is the Ramon map. So the red line you see here, that's the Ramon spectrum of a pristine sample. And the blue one you see here, that's the Ramon spectrum of the indented sample. Um, you can see the sharp peaks that are kind of gone, replaced by a huge bump, um, huge bump here. People assign that as the amorphous peak. If you plot the intensity of the amorphous peak, you can see under the indent, there's a lot of pixels showing high intensity. So this is a regular undoped boron carbide, a lot of amorphization. After doping, so more or less the same, that's the pristine one, the silicon doped boron carbide, that's the Ramon band. And after indentation, you see quite limited amorphous bands and most of the crystalline bands are retained. So that gives us in, an indication, indication by putting small amount of boron, sorry, by putting small amount of silicon into boron carbide, we were able to suppress Amorphization. It is also shown in the Ramon map here. So if you look at the intensity of the amorphous peak here, it's not as strong as the regular boron carbide. So silicon doping works, but why? Why is working? Again, as a TM like you know group, um, the first thing we do is like to to prepare TM samples. Using regular TM, it's hard to tell. Uh, I forgot to mention the work was done by CC, who was a postdoc in our group. Now she's a, a staff at MCF. If you need to use SEM. She's the person to, to reach out. She's very nice and very knowledgeable. So using regular TEM, um, we, we can see like, you know, there's a crack that, that's the impression, indent impression, that's a crack. Outside the, uh, the damage zone, we have the pristine zone. There's a lot of elast elastic strain going on. But this map and this map or this micrograph and the, like that micrograph, it's very difficult to tell the differences using regular TEM. Again, we used PED to see whether we can fish out some more apparent differences. So the first method we used is we overlaid the orientation mapping, something you should be familiar with already, orientation mapping with something called index mapping. I'll quickly explain how indexing mapping works. So indexing mapping, the experimental data of the diffraction is compared to the simulated diffraction. If it's a good match, then it will be bright in the pixel. If we have a crack, so we have no diffraction pattern, or if we have the amorphous phase, then again, we don't get spots. It will be a diffuse ring. Then the computer will be, will be confused 
and um, there's no template that matches the experimental data. And the computer will decide this, there's nothing to index and it will appear to be dark. So it will be bad indexing. The third example is crystals overlay. If you have two sets of diffraction pattern overlaying together, the computer will again be confused, not able to index, it will appear dark as well. So let's look at what we have here. On the left, that's the regular boron carbide. On the right, that's the silicon doped boron carbide. On the right, you can clearly see those line structure, these defects present in the material. Um, we know that amorphization uh, from previous studies, amorphization, they tend to form on specific crystallographic planes and they will evolve into cracks. So these cracks you see here, these were caused by amorphization, eventually like leads, leads to the, uh, the micro cracking. But in the silicon doped boron carbide, only the top left part, you see some of the uh, shear bands, sorry, amorphization caused micro cracks. The rest of the sample is a direct fragmentation. Okay. Then in addition to the orientation plus indexing map, we can do more data processing to get more information. These are like pencil sketches, like pencil sketches, but these are actually generated from the data. Um, the map you see here is called cross correlation coefficient map. What this means, cross correlation uh, works in this way. Assuming this is the diffraction pattern, it compares itself to the neighboring diffraction patterns. If it's in the same grain, if it's in the same grain, um, this pattern is the same as all the neighboring patterns. The computer will say it's a good match. So the pixel will appear to be dark, uh, to be bright. That's exactly what you see here. If you're yeah, crossing a grain boundary. So again, that's the uh, diffraction pattern of interest. The bottom two, the, 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 the one on the left and the one down the bottom, they are with, within the same grain, but the top and the one on the right, these are from a different grain. Then the uh, computer will say, okay, the difference is so big from the neighbors, it will appear to be dark. Similarly, if there's a micro crack, nothing to index, the difference is huge and it will appear dark as well. In this case, all the apparent features you see, those are the cracks. All the fine features you see, these are the elastic strain stored in the sample. So again, this confirms that in the regular boron carbide, the um, failure mechanism is from crystalline to amorphous phase to crack. But for the silicon doped boron carbide, it largely bypasses amorphization. So it's crystalline to direct, direct cracking. So these are the, uh, the differences we can, we can reveal. Using orientation mapping, like uh, not only we can study those bulk samples, we can also look at nanoparticles and the nano um, wires. Uh, in this slide on the left, those are the gold nanoparticles. Um, one interesting thing uh, we noticed when I saw the picture was the five fold nano twins. So you can see one, two, three, four, five. So these, Domains are separated by the twin boundaries. Um, this micrograph was provided by Nanomagus, the company who sold us the, uh, the instrument. Again, you can see the scale bar is 10 nanometers. Most of the nanoparticles are 100 nanometers in size. Another example was done by my uh, student who just graduated, uh, Dixing. We had magnesium nanowires from Dr. Banerjee's group in chemistry. They are interested in knowing along which direction those nanowires were grown. And by doing the orientation mapping, the Shin indexed that and uh, um, concluded the um, nanowires to grow along the 002 direction, the C axis of the, of the crystals. And it's pretty much the same for all the nanowires. Uh, I'm not sure like in the soil and the crop department, um, if you study the soil specimens, in most of the cases you will deal with like nano or micro scale particles. Maybe this is one of the, um, techniques you can use to study like on, along which direction these crystals are growing. So that's one potential applications I can think of. Okay. Um, any questions about, uh-huh. The other thing I thought of is, yeah, so I thought of, you know, soil minerality and then even relating that to soil erosion potential. And, um, 
I was trying to think of something else. Yeah, how can you use it? Those are the two things I've got. <laughs> um, I think we can have a lot of potential to study our soil minerals. Most of our soil minerals are either, to me, we call them uh, colony, volatile, human. To you, you will call, once you see those pictures, you call them monosphere, monofiber, <laughs> or some sort of monosheet. I think uh, we're sensible looking at different areas. I think this most technology definitely we can start a lot of details of minerals. One thing is very, very different from all soil minerals, different from those specimens. Most of our particles are poly crystalline. They are not amorphous, definitely not um, as crystalline as your uh, boron. Boron uh, uh, yeah. Yes. So we, we do need to study those details because a lot of reactivities will be related to the surface feature and the structure disorder. And so this is something we try to, try to do in our lab too. So probably can put a more alpha word. Sure. So how we can collaborate on this one. Okay, it sounds good. Also, um, uh, just a couple of things about the mapping. Usually to acquire one map, it only takes 10 minutes. So it's super fast to acquire something like, like this. Okay, um, this one question I want to ask, uh -huh. how long it will take? How many data points, how many points you need to scan? Mm. Because you are doing diffraction. Each diffraction actually is a picture. Yep. It's a picture, picture. So how big is your file if you scan mm. so many? Spores yep. and then take a one picture, divide the data each spot. So you told the how big is the file to get one byte. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, the map we see usually there are two hundred by two hundred or three hundred by three hundred pixels. So just you can do a quick calculation how many diffraction patterns we have to save. Uh, the standard um, data size, like you know, two hundred by two hundred or three hundred by three hundred, there are usually five gigabytes for each map. Uh, the hard drive fills up very quickly. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> uh, also at MIC, um, uh, they also have the in situ heating holder. So one thing I hope to do is to combine the PED mapping like capability with the in situ heating capability. That's something like you know. Again, I'm not sure whether um, can be applied to to soil and uh, crop studies. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, these are the examples I'd like to share with you about uh, uh, orientation mapping. I'll just have a quick look at the chat box to see whether there's a question. There are suggestions for working with the beam sensor, uh, sensitive materials. Uh, again, that's a really good question. Um, for beam sensitive materials, there are two ways we can overcome, like, you know, the beam damage. One is to, um, uh, for, for the voltage, we cannot do too much on the TEM. Uh, it's all set, um, but we can reduce the, uh, the current. Um, so use like um, a large number spot size in TEM that's actually dimmer beam. Um, that's one way to do it. Another way is um, uh, you can always use the area. You can always sacrifice an area to do focus, to do focusing. The move to like, an, like, like a virgin area, do the single, like round of scanning. In this case, you can also minimize the other beam damage. Um, the third way is to use a cryo holder. Um, at MIC, they also have like the cryo TM holder. You don't have to use that only for the bio stuff. You can also use it as a cooling holder. When the sample is cooled down at very low temperature, it will be less beam sensitive. Does this answer your question? Okay. You said that sample preparation is very, or what kind of sample preparation steps? Mm. Have it depends on what kind of samples you have. If you have like uh, powders, like, you know, just soil, um, like based on my powder experience, what I usually do is to mix it with ethanol, prepare it like up and down to have like a good mixing, then put a job uh, on the TEM grid, then put a grid in TEM. Uh, that's pretty easy. If you have bulk samples, like uh, if you have like a rock, you want to cut something out, then uh, we'll have to use a technique called focus ion beam. So it's like a nanoscale knife to cut something 100 nanometers in uh, thickness, place it um, on the TM grid. Um, for metals, uh, you can also use electro polishing. Um, for polymers, for something soft, uh, you can use uh, a technique called microtome. 
um, it's a diamond knife, then just doing like kind of like cutting prosciutto, <laughs> cutting ham, doing slice by slice. Okay, so if you ask me if I would want to ask, well, for your mama invent that experiment you did, mama invented it before you prepared the TMs. Uh, um, in this example, that was before. So we did nano indentation first, then found the indenting pressure, did fib lift out. Okay. My question is during the work, during your fib section, when that person some kind of change in the structure or not? Exactly. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, yes, it will. It will. Um, um, the boundary conditions are different. Like if there's a lot of stress stored in the material, once like you know it's free, it will just expand and relax the stress. So it does alter the uh, um, the microstructure, especially cracking. In some of the cases, the cracks will not open unless you give that like you know enough room to to open up and the, like you know thin enough sample. So it will. But we believe the plastic deformation part, like the permanent deformation part, will remain more or less the same. That is our hope. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a very good point. Whenever we do sample prep, we actually change more or less the other specimen. Okay, um, okay so let's move to the second part of the, the, the presentation. It's on the strain mapping. Okay, again, like um, if you want to do strain mapping, EBSD is a really good technique. I took the example from uh, Oxford Instruments website. This is a bent nickel tube. If it's bent, you know that on the top, it experiences the tensile stress. If you bend it, like it's getting stretched, but down the bottom, it's compressed. And somewhere in the center is called neutral axis. And this is, is um, exactly what um, um, EBSD is able to tell you. And the technique is called KAM, kernel average misorientation. We'll have a quick look at that in a, in a, in a minute. Um, in the KAM map, you can see when it's tensile, you get a lot of strain. If it's compressive, you get a, lo a lot of strain. In the center, because it's neutral axis, there's no compression or, or tension, so there's no strain. Then how does KAM work? Um, it works in this way. In SEM, like you know, in EBSD, we get information for each pixel. And for each pixel, it will look at its orientation. So if this is the pixel of interest, it looks at the orientation. It will be compared to the neighbors. If the neighbors have the same misorientation, the difference is small. And this pixel will be identified as strain free. If we have the orientation of this pixel like that, the neighbors have very different orientations. The computer will say this pixel is strained. Um, in this example, I'm only using the first nearest neighbor. Uh, in most of the commercial softwares, uh, they use the third nearest neighbor. So uh, that's the other small difference. Okay. Um, there are advantages and the disadvantages of using KAM to study the residual strain in the material. So the first advantage is it gives you good visualization of the subgrain structures and the, uh, and the strain distribution in the material as shown here in the bent nickel tube. Okay. For the limitations, it's pretty um, self-evident. The first is limited spatial resolution. It's an EBSD-based technique. You cannot beat the resolution of EBSD. In fact, you're comparing like each pixel to the third nearest neighbor. You further degrade the resolution. Okay. The second thing is it, it is not able to distinguish the elastic strain and the plastic strain. Elastic strain is something you can recover. On the rubber band, you pull it, you let go you will just re recover. Plastic strain is permanent. Um, using this technique, there's no way to tell them apart. We know there's strain, that's it. We don't know whether it's permanent or non-permanent. Also, there's no strain direction. In the example on the left, like it's tensile, like it's bright green, it's compressive, it's also bright green. It does not tell you whether it's tensile by like getting pulled or it's getting pushed. Um, the example I'm going to show you was really done by Paul Rothman, who was a PhD student in my advisor's group. Um, what he did was um, he used PED to get the, uh, the strain information. The idea is very simple. If we elastically pull something in real space, then the diffraction pattern will be squashed. Diffraction pattern is also called in the K space or in the reciprocal space. Again, like the double slit experiment, 
um, the double slits um, diffraction, if you make the two slits far, like far apart, the diffraction pattern is getting squashed. If you bring the two slits close together, the diffraction pattern will be stretched. So the same idea here. Again, like if the material is elastically compressed in real space, in the reciprocal space, it will be stretched in the same direction. Um, so everything we see here, they are elastic strain. You may wonder how about plastic strain uh, in materials. Plastic strain is accommodated by either dislocations or deformation twins or phase transformation. All of these you can see using TEM easily. So using PED, we can capture the elastic residual strain. Okay, um, this is one slide about uh, precession. We said PED, PED, like why doing precession? First of all, what is precession? Um, when the beam comes down, it's like that. So this is regular TEM, but um, the coil or the, 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 the PED instrument rocks the beam. So the beam stays on the same point, but it rocks, forms a cone. And why doing that? Um, this is one example from Paul again. Um, he looked at like the diffraction pattern, like just 20 nanometers apart. So this is the diffraction pattern on the left. This is the diffraction pattern on the right without any precession. Because like, you know, for all TM samples that are pretty thin, there's always some bending going on and small bending can cause a fairly large difference in the diffraction pattern. When you do the precession, you actually excite higher order diffraction spots. And this is one degree precession, like, you know, at the left point. And this is one degree, one degree precession on the point, like on the point on the right. So in this case, you can actually compare the two diffraction patterns and calculate the strain information. Okay, uh, this example I took from the, uh, the company um, and that's why we bought the, uh, the, uh, the instrument. Um, this is a silicon, like, you know, silicon chip. The substrate is pure silicon. And um, what is deposited on top, that silicon germanium, uh, germanium doped silicon. At the interface, because germanium doped silicon, they have larger lattice parameter compared to pure silicon. So there's elastic, elastic strain at the interface. Even in the STEM scanning transmission electron like micrograph, you can see the strain information. This is the result from the strain mapping. So you can look at the strain in X, X direction because now we know how the diffraction pattern are stretched. If it's stretched in this way, we know it's strain along the X direction. If it's stretched vertically, we know it's the strain along the Y direction. So we can study the strain along the X direction as well as the strain in the Y direction. In this case, not only we can visualize the strain, we can also quantify the strain. So that's the other unique advantage. My advisor um, said, that's great. Like, you know, it works well for um, like functional semiconductors. How about like structural materials, the materials we deal with every day, but not in the, in the smartphones and the computer chips. Okay, so again, we used boron carbide as an example. This is one grain you can see here. And we assumed inside the grain, there's no strain. But near the grain boundary, we see strain. That's what we assumed. Paul did the other strain mapping, and this is the strain map. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the scale, it's 0.02%. So it's not 2%, it's 0.02%. That tells us how accurate or how fine strain we can capture using the technique. We also integrated the other strain from left to right just to get like uh, the baseline. Um, this is what he obtained. And since we assumed inside the grain, there's no residual strain, he said, um, this is the results. Let's look at two sigma. Anything within two sigma, we assume that's strain free. Anything outside the two sigmas, we say there's strain. So the strain sensitivity is roughly around 0.05%. Anything greater than 0.05, then we're confident saying likely there's strain here. We were really lucky to get um, something like this. It's a polycrystalline sample. This is the out of plane inverse pole figure, like the orientation map. Um, they have the same out of plane orientation, but different in plane orientation. Um, for those in the classroom, you can actually, in, in the lecture theater, you can see uh, my two hands, they have the same out of plane orientation, but they have different in plane orientation. So if you look in this way, they have the same axis pointing out, but in plane is different. And if we look at in-plane IPF, they are not. 
Okay, and um, the crystal structure of uh, boron carbide is hexagonal. So the orange grain, um, they have the hexagonal structures like that. The blue grain is about 70 degrees apart. So that's the misorientation. Um, Paul then did some like, you know, really quick and the back of the envelope calculation. He said, during the sintering process, when doing ceramics, we pack all the powders, the heat at a very high temperature, then cool that down, you get a consolidated piece. That's how ceramics are sintered. Um, he assumes that the creep or diffusion governed kind of sintering process um, shuts down at um, 1,673 Kelvin. And as you cool down, um, the crystal will shrink in a different way. Remember, we mentioned boron carbide has hexagonal structure. There's A axis and the C axis. So if there's a hex, um, hexagonal structure, this will be the A axis. This will be the C axis. C axis actually shrinks more as you cool down compared to the, the A axis. He then also constructed a very simple model. Instead of having two grains 70 degrees apart, he had two grains 90 degrees apart. Um, we have green one, green two. Assuming like, you know, these grains are free to shrink. This is what we're gonna get. Because C axis will shrink more, A axis will shrink less. But in fact, in, in, in reality, the green boundary glues the two crystals together. So that's what we get in the real case. What this tells us is the grain on the left near the green boundary, there's tensile strain, it's trying to pull the strain. Whereas the grain on the right, grain two, the residual strain is trying to push the strain. Um, this is what he predicted, is that what he saw in the, uh, in the experiment. So again, back to that. And on the grain, the orange grain, we should have smaller shrinkage. So it will be compressive residual strain. And the grain, the blue grain, um, will have large shrinkage. Shrinkage will be tensile strain. Um, he looked at the, uh, the region highlighted by the, uh, the box. And this is the strain map. Um, it's quite interesting. Like when it's away from the grain boundary, you don't see too much strain. But as you approach the grain boundary, you see compress compressive strain. He also quantified that. Remember the two sigmas, within the two sigmas, we consider that a strain frame. Outside the two sigmas, we consider that a strain. Um, as you get closer and closer to the grain boundary, the magnitude of the strain increases it's nearly exponentially. That agrees really well with the elastic model. So what Paul predicted agrees really well with what he saw in the, in the, uh, in the experiment. Okay, um, what we have done so far is to use the company software to do strain mapping, but this is not result or re, uh, result limitations. The company software can only do single crystal strain mapping. It cannot do the, uh, the polycrystal mapping. The reason is because whenever we do mapping, the strain mapping, we have to define a direction. For example, if we do strain mapping along this direction, if the neighboring grains rotated, we don't have that information anymore. So the comparison is not direct. One thing in our group is we are still, uh, we are still in the process you know, of developing strain mapping capabilities for polycrystalline samples. Um, we start from single crystal just to see whether our algorithm works or not. So the, uh, the, the, the goal is to design the, uh, develop the algorithm that can work on polycrystals but we start with the single crystal. The sample uh, is a magnesium sample and you can see the dislocation lines. This is a 760 by 760 map. So it's a really huge map. Again, the work was done by De Xing. If you zoom in, zoom in, zoom in further, like zoom in. If we zoom into that red spot here, you actually get a raise of diffraction pattern. That's what, you, what happens when you keep zooming in, keep zooming in, keep zooming in. And from the diffraction pattern, we can just have a really close look. Um, what the Xing did was, um, we we're trying to come up with a technique to do strain mapping ourselves. Then we need to be able to measure the distance from the diffractive spots, diffractive beam to the center spot. So there are a few steps. The first step in the algorithm is we identify the position of the center beam. After that, we determine the position of the diffracted beam. The third step is to calculate the distance and to plot the uh, histogram. And 
That's the histogram. Um, uh, for those who have done XRD, X-ray diffraction, what we do here is actually very similar to XRD. Um, you can see peaks of different planes, but this is really at a nanoscale, at a nanoscale. Okay. Um, let's look at another example. Again, you see the dislocation lines here. And uh, um, the shin focused on this peak here. I think that's the 002 peak. Then calculated the distance from the, uh, the, uh, the center spot and the mapped the other result. This is the result he was able to achieve. Um, you can still see, like somewhat see where the dislocation lines are. On one side of the dislocation line, it's blue. On the other side of the dislocation line, it's red. That agrees with the elastic theory of dislocations. Doesn't matter what kind of dislocations you have. On one side, it's compressive. On the other side, it's tensile. So that agrees with the, uh, the, uh, the prediction very well. But again, our method is not without um, issues. You can see there's one block here we cannot explain. There's also some like, you know, high strain here. So there's still a lot of things we are working on try to improve this algorithm. Okay, so in terms of the outlook, like it's promising. For example, if we have tilted boundary, um, we can directly compare this distance to that distance. We're no longer limited by like, you know, the same grain anymore. However, there are some challenges we face. I hope the, uh, the uh, um, video works. Okay, cool. So if you look at that spot, the red spot, but it's moving to different pixels in the image, I'll play that again. The diffraction spot does not really move, but the red spot jumps around. So there's something wrong with our determination, something we need to improve. The second limitation is more intrinsic. Um, if the grain is oriented in a, we call BRAC condition, we see a lot of diffraction spots, but if it's away from the BRAC condition, we have limited spots. So for example, we have two grains, grain one, grain two. Grain one, I call that information rich. We have a lot of things we can, like, you know, do data mining, we can, we can extract. But for, for grain two, there's so few diffraction spots we can work with. So our algorithm will work well with information rich grains, may not be very powerful for the information poor, like grains. So again, that's something we're still working on how to overcome these challenges. So there are two, I guess, main takeaway messages uh, from my presentation. Um, the first one is I hope um, you understand how the orientation map works in TEM and potentially how this can benefit your research. The second takeaway message is hopefully uh, you understand now how the strain mapping works in TEM and hopefully one day you can apply that to your research as well. Um, most of the work was really done by the members in my group. So this is the um, photo we took last summer. Uh, we were able to dine in the restaurant. Also, uh, we collaborated extensively like within the campus, within a and as, well, uh, as well as outside a and And I look, also look forward to the opportunities to collaborate with you. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. I am just wondering if you ever tried to use any plant material, like plants or material in your history. I'm, um, I'm just asking this thing from like plant. Um, that, that, that's a really good question. I haven't done that myself. But I do know the company looked at some bio tissues and resolved the, uh, the crystal structure. Uh, I think it's like a lung tissue, maybe like from, um, maybe from heavy smoker. And they were able to resolve the, the crystals in the lung tissue using this technique. So if you have crystals in your plant, then likely you'll be able to resolve the, the microstructure. Nice. Right. Yes, please. What about on the strain testing? been able to use plant materials on that. We do a lot of strain testing on things like cotton fiber mm -hmm. to see where it'll break and, and the quality of the cotton fiber. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very interested in it for hemp fiber mm -hmm. for building products. Can you use that technique on fiber? It's natural, or is it need to have crystalline? Um, that's a really good question. Um, um, for this technique to work, uh, ideally it has to be crystalline. Then we'll have like 
spots to identify. Um, one thing I do know at UC Berkeley, they have a very similar technique. They do something similar on glass. Glass is fully amorphous. So the diffraction, you get amorphous ring, diffuse ring. When they strain the glass in TEM, the ring becomes elliptical. So there's a possibility it can also be used on the, the cotton, cotton fibers. There's a possibility. I've never tried it myself. How much does it cost? The instrument or? Well, the instrument, and then how much does it cost to do analysis? Mm. Um, the, the instrument cost me like half of my startup. <laughs> so uh, that was uh, slightly over 300K for the instrument. Then I donated the instrument to what uh, MIC. So it's a user facility everyone can use. Um, to use the instrument is for free. There's no charge on the PD part, but there's a charge on the TEM part. The TEM is $70 an hour. Um, for the analysis, um, we, since we gave everything to MIC, there's a um, like really powerful computer. Uh, it's super cheap to use. It's like a dollar per hour to do a data analysis. Um, if the student is familiar with the process, usually one hour per, se per sample from setting up to run the map, which is 10 minutes, to finishing everything off, like retracting the holder, finishing the session. Uh, it's like if the student is familiar with the technique, it's one hour per sample. Other questions? Oh, uh, let me see in Zoom. Feel free to ask questions. You know you're obligated to ask questions. <laughs> Have you ever used a support vector machine instead of K nearest neighbor to you know, falsify the damage on your materials? Can, can you say that uh, again? Have you ever used a support vector machine regression or classification instead of using KNM? Like I guess you use the KNM onboard to to um, you know identify the damage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um... KM, yeah, for, for the strain uh, in SEM. What, what was the first one? A vector. I just asked, have you ever used other algorithms? Oh, okay. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, that's a really good question. KM is uh, widely available, and uh, that's kind of like uh, what people usually use. There's a company, a very small company, it's a spin off from Oxford Instruments. They do cross court, um, um, like they make cross court software. Um, in, a, uh, in KM, um, it looks at the oil angle of that pixel, then compares the like oil angle, just the angle, um, to the neighbors looking at the, the difference. But in cross court, in that company, uh, very similar to PED, it saves every single Kikuchi pattern from EBSD. And um, the Kikuchi pattern in EBSD, like the, the, the width of the band corresponds to two theta in XRD. If there's elastic strain, it will be either stretched or pushed so they use that to get the elastic strain information. So uh, SEM-based techniques, you can also use cross court to get elastic residual strain information, in addition to KEM, if strain is of your interest. Okay, nice. I have one more question. Uh -huh. and for instance, I'm working on the main score, and so there is a big problem in the car, so there is small flushing. So what you means uh, that and or when it received a really harsh environmental condition. And you talk about the limitation of usage of the uh, strain, like strain mapping. So for instance, when we use a like a maze uh, to identify which one is more like resistant to bending over or which one is less resistant. I'm just ask, asking to quantify this situation because this is really hard. What we are doing is we're just looking at it and like then okay, this one looks like more headache as compared to other one it was stronger. This is like quantification based on our eyes, but we would like to assess this uh, trade like in terms of numbers. So then we can assess this by using this technique. This is why I'm asking if we have used any that so. Okay, that's a really good question. Uh, in material science, we always say like, um, the property is governed by the microstructure. So uh, uh, why some of the plants are more likely to, to bend than the others? Um, to me, fundamentally, it's from the structure. Um, um, I, of course, you mentioned there's also one big limitation of PED is the area. Um, the resolution is great. 
but we lose the, 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 the field of view. The biggest map we can map is four microns by four microns. That's the biggest map. So for your, um, like, for the challenges you face, to me, I think it's more like an SEN based technique um, to study the microstructure. Um, this is just too small. It gives the precision, but loses the big picture. Um, kind of like, uh, while looking at one leaf, <laughs> turn a blind eye to, to the entire forest. Precision, I see. Interesting, interesting. Okay, thank you. Oh, yes, please. Oh. Oh, in the chat box. Okay. There, there's, there's a question also, like in class. Maybe we do the one in class first. Yeah. Uh huh. Of horn, and we use that method of comparing the directions if you have, you know, if they line up or if they don't line up, isolating it based on the dark color of its outer line with the other crop, the other stands. That would involve electrons like cross. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you did it yeah. well. <laughs> okay, great. And uh, there's a question. Um, do you think you can use this technique to map the distribution of different minerals in the region of the sample? Uh, quick answer is yes. Uh, again, it's limited by how big the minerals. If the particles are like five microns, like sheets, then if we map it, it's just a single crystal. If those are like, you know, nanocrystalline, um, this is ideal to study like really small features. So quick answer is yes, but depends on the size of the, the particles. I know what I should want to do because we are working on some very small part of the analysis. Oh, so we need to do more of all kinds of things. Sure, sure. Then, then that's ideal. If there are microns in size, then this technique is it's um it's not the right tool. Other questions? Can I? How many samples can we do at once? Just one. Um, in this example, like uh, if you have nanoparticles, so uh, you can actually get. Quite a bit, so so roughly ten, <laughs> like in this example, yeah. <laughs> um, and also, this is super fine map. Like you can always zoom out a little bit and capture more, but you will sacrifice resolution. Any other questions? Questions? Oh, Thing about that. Uh, so after you, after you make a probe, right? You said there's an amorphous region. Have you gained any information on how you might go about repairing something from based on how the structure breaks down? It's, I know there's like you know self healing yeah, yeah. cars and things like that now. Um I heard about it, but I'm not an expert. Um for the body armor material born carbide, one thing we do know is it's bad, like it doesn't self-heal. If there's a way to find like um if there's way we can find to self-heal the body armor. I'm pretty sure it's like a major kind of like publication. <laughs> but um, I don't, I cannot think of any quick ways to, 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 to address that issue in that direction. But that's a very good point. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's uh, thank our speaker again. Thank you.